So our next speaker is Liz Hunter. Liz Hunter graduated from Woodbury University with a Master's of Landscape Architecture in 2019 before coming to the MAS MBC program. Her background consists of a military diving career with the US Coast Guard, a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the Coast Guard Academy, and she's excited to get involved of the, in the management and design of our California coastline. In her spare time, you can find her on a paddleboard somewhere in between Catalina Island and San Diego Bay. The title of her presentation today is Living Underwater, a review of California's artificial reefs and an interactive story map. Great, thank you, Samantha. Good afternoon. As Samantha mentioned, I graduated Woodbury University's architecture program a few weeks before coming here to study at Scripps. And what you see here is an architectural rendering. Maybe a familiar scene to most of you. The San Diego skyline. And during my studies at Woodbury, my architecture classmates and I walked the city streets regularly. We studied public transportation issues and saw major stormwater runoff issues firsthand. We tried to design solutions with function and purpose. We were continuously brainstorming new ideas and constantly designing, trying to create better ways. Better ways for parking and pedestrian access better ways for outdoor space and gathering areas, better ways to develop affordable housing and shelter. And in choosing an additional graduate program here at Scripps, I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could take that way of thinking underwater. And this is what attracted me to my capstone project. Underneath the waters of our California coast, however, we're no longer looking at skyscrapers and stadiums or concrete bridges. Rather, we're staring straight down a different corridor, like this rocky reef. Both vegetation and marine life swaying back and forth from the ebb and flow of the tides and swell. This type of structure can provide shelter too. Yes, this marine community is very different than our land community, but can we take the same approach when managing it? Artificial reefs have been used as an enhancement tool off the coast of California since the 50s. But without proper, manage, proper monitoring and customized management, it is difficult to understand the effects that these artificial reefs have on our marine communities. These marine communities thrive with a delicate balance of the right temperature and the right levels of nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. These communities are also greatly affected by our anthropogenic uses, such as nearshore development, shipping lanes, groundwater runoff, and fishing grounds. Specifically in LA and San Diego counties, artificial reefs were originally constructed in the 50s as there was an increased in interest in sport fishing opportunities, and as unfortunately, kelp forests like this continued to deteriorate. Today, with the ocean continuing to warm and acidify, and the world population continuing to increase, fish populations and marine ecosystems face unforeseen dangers, including the reduction of fish stocks and the degradation of the marine habitat. Historically, conventional fisheries management processes have been used, that have been used have been species-specific based. And now a more modern approach is ecosystem-based, which includes natural methods such as developing marine protected areas, as well as some artificial methods such as constructing artificial reefs. So for my capstone project, I completed a literature review of California's artificial reefs. I then created an interactive story map to help communicate my findings and provide a foundation for future management decisions. The story map, will be used as a foundation this summer um, for a virtual workshop working with California Sea Grant and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Key stakeholders will convene and discuss future management and improve procedures. So the first question that I found myself asking as a landlubber architect was what is the actual definition of an artificial reef? According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, a man, it is a man-made structure that may mimic some of the characteristics of a natu natural reef. So then naturally, the next question I asked myself, okay, well, what type of material um, could mimic the reefs off of our California coast? 
With the images that you just saw of a beautiful rocky reef and the giant kelp forest, you can let your mind wander and imagine for a few seconds. Are you thinking street poles and toilet bowls? Or maybe you're thinking old tires and ships. All of those are surprisingly correct. You're looking at a picture of the Yukon here, and this is a ship that was sunk off of Pacific Beach. It serves as a busy and active recreational dive site here in San Diego. This is a toilet bowl artificial reef sketch, like the one constructed in Santa Monica Bay off Malibu a few decades ago. And the very first two artificial reefs constructed in California were also made out of some interesting material. The first was Paradise Cove Landing, completed in May of 1958 in northern Santa Monica Bay. It was made out of 20 old automobile bodies and placed in about 50 feet of water. The second was constructed off Redondo Beach just a few months later in September. It was made out of six old wooden cars and placed approximately the same depth, about 60 feet. In both of these cases, these materials were used because they were available and cheap. The streetcars in Redondo Beach were actually donated and sunk by the US Navy who towed them just a few miles north from LA Harbor. However, as we have learned, there's a definite danger in that. Materials and location must be chosen carefully. So not to pollute the water, disrupt functioning marine ecosystems, or pose a hazard to navigation. The artificial reef that, of tires that I mentioned, yeah, it didn't last for very long. As soon as a big storm came through, it ripped its mooring from the bottom, and the tires came up, um, floated up, and eventually ended up on shore. Artificial reefs can, though, if implemented properly, provide a new marine habitat by increasing the surface area for wildlife that settles out of the water column and increases the complexity of communities that are attracted to the new growth. And even though initially artificial reef success was defined primarily around sport fishing and a single species management method was used, we now know that management decisions should take more of an ecosystem-based approach and need to consider both biological and physical conditions. So it is my hope that this literature review will help inform a future California statewide management plan. The four topics that I um, focused for my liter literature review included habitat replacement, contribution to the standing stock, managing the reefs, and then lessons learned. Fish and wildlife then helped draft associated scientific questions for each of these categories, and that's where I um, focus my research. However, today I will only be focusing on the management of these reefs. So with this in mind, I am going to dive into the story map that I developed to help consolidate and communicate my findings as well as assist in the discussion for the virtual workshop this summer. So, <clears throat> Oops. This story map is divided into six different tabs with one main interactive map that displays all the artificial reefs with a red dot. It also has multiple layers depending on which subsection you click on. They'll update on the main stage as you see here. <clears throat> and I'm gonna take you through a few scenarios of how different users could use this website and benefit from all this information being in one place. If I were a resource manager or a coastal committee member, I could come here, zoom into the San Clemente artificial reef, click the red dot, and get some basic information. In addition, if the artificial reef has published journals or other references, I could go to the next tab and, cor and uh, correlate the numbers listed to any uh, published journals or other material that um, might help educate me on this artificial reef. And I could read each of the abstracts for each paper, or just review the pertinent information that I might need for my meeting, let's say, tomorrow morning. So now let's say I'm a high school biology teacher. I could use this site to educate my students on, Cal on the history of California's artificial reefs, or I could focus on a lesson about California's marine habitats. I could discuss both rocky reefs and kelp forests, and then I could come here to actually show the students the kelp coverage that we had off of our coast in 2016. As you can see right here off of Palos Verdes. 
So this might be a good opportunity to then assign my students a paper on these, on the effects that the artificial reefs just north might have on the kelp forest just south. And if I were a salty sailor, I might just want to come here to better understand the location of the artificial reefs in my backyard. So let's say I live in Pacific Beach and am an avid diver or spearfisher. I could come here and look up the Yukon and Wreck Alley and become familiar with their depth and location and use that information to draft a safe dive plan. And then if so inspired, maybe after hearing this presentation, I could go to the Moving Forward tab and click on the survey that Fish and Wildlife has developed to let me um, tell them which reefs I use and what marine life I might have encountered. So in closing, I'd like to propose the following framework adapted from one of the journals I read. It can be summarized in six simple steps. Use science. Use science before establishing artificial reefs and in the management of our current ones. Step two, establish clear and quantifiable goals for each reef. Step three, implement a consistent monitoring method. This way data can be compared and help us evaluate the reef to see if it has met its original goal that we developed in step two. Step four, mitigate. Mitigate negative impacts to both the current marine life and the marine environment. Step five, complement other fisheries management measures, including marine protected areas and seasonal closures. And the final step is manage adaptively. We can always do better. So review this process, let's say, every five years to ensure it's still working. And whatever process we use, it should be repeatable and transparent to both managers and the public. So as we move forward, whether it's a six-step approach or another framework, we need to ensure that we are using a methodical method when managing artificial reefs, just like when we construct new buildings or bridges or public parks. Knowing and understanding the marine environment prior to and after the construction of any artificial reef will be key in understanding if this enhancement tool is achieving its end goal. Setting performance standards and having reference reefs are essential in their evaluation. And continuing research and sharing that data and knowledge will be critical to forming the statewide management plan. Thank you very much for your time. Questions? Yeah, thank you, Liz. Um, so what does a long-term artificial reef program look, to, look like to you? Uh, great question. Thank you for asking. Um, it looks like a collaborative effort between universities and independent research groups and different government entities. Um, it would have a thorough and established monitoring system that enables data to be compared and shared easily. Um, that data would con um, consist of reef attributes, um, fish density, biomass, uh, assemblage of the structure, and uh, a technical advisory team would eventually be established as well to help fish and wildlife um, make informed decisions on management and funding would be found or even shared with other ecosystem-based approach methods that might already have funding and um, to ensure that the monitoring efforts are being implemented and completed in a long-term sustainable way. Um, and any new artificial reefs would be well researched and implemented in a stage process to ensure that proper equilibrium would be achieved, which usually occurs every, uh, it's different for every reef, but approximately five to 10 years, it takes an artificial reef to achieve its equilibrium. Great, and we have a question here from the web. Okay. Um, what do you think the future of artificial reefs looks like in California? Do you think we'll see new artificial reefs going into the water anytime soon? Um, so um, there are two ongoing mitigation projects, which is displayed in the story map as well. Um, the, the first is an ongoing project in um, San Clemente that I, I brought up. So that one's continuing and then Currently, just this month in Palos Verdes, um, 
Vantuna Research Group is working with Occidental College, and they're doing a mitigation reef up there. Um, so, yes, I do feel like new artificial reefs will be in the water, and we also have oil and glass, gas platforms that have to be de decommissioned, so that might be another opportunity for artificial reefs in California as well. <laughs>